Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you gave to the apostles grace truly to believe and preach and write your word. Grant, we pray that we would love that written word. For him 23, this is the last of the noonday things showed. Now grant us undiminished strength to stand and do what still remains. Well, we turn to Leslie serves me right. It's, she shows her command of the English language. I've got a number of class, a bunch of good one-liners that emerge. But let's see. I also, in the past, have recommended this as probably the quickest, fastest, succinct thing that you give to your father or mother or aunt or uncle want a one volume on Cranmer. That's as memory serves, but let's see. We'll reevaluate it. Let the jury we'll listen to the evidence. Emblem of Faith Untouched is a biography written for those interested in Thomas Cranmer and the English Reformation, but who are not professionals, scholars in the field. Dermot McCulloch's brilliant and in-depth study provides a compendium of information about Cranmer, addressing scholars' contradictions about Cranmer's life, motives, and personality, as well as effect on the development of the Anglican Church. I'm deeply indebted to McCulloch for providing such a comprehensive and factual study. This book is a text for seminarians, priests, and lay students of English history and theology, the development of the Anglican Episcopal Church. Though the book includes the theology and history of the period, it is primary anecdotal in focus, telling the stories of Cranmer's life. Originally based on John Fox's narrative in the Acts and Monuments, the current biography tends to view Cranmer's martyrdom from the Anglican perspective but includes information for, from other biographical sources, including the Roman Catholic view, thus making Thomas Cranmer as human and real as possible. For smoother read, all quotations, ideas, events, and facts are documented in the back. Chapter 1, the beginning, is a prayer. Grant to us, Lord, we beseech thee, the spirit to think and do always those things that are rightful that we which cannot without thee may by thee be able to live according to thy will through Jesus Christ our Lord. I forget which one it is, but that's Collect and Trinity, I don't know, seven, eight, nine, somewhere in there. It's a beloved Collect. You can see where that doctrine penetrates. You end up with scholarship and right thinking and right living. Give us the ability to think aright and live aright. That gets into you the ethos of the prayer book. It's no wonder there's a lineage of scholarship. The quaint modern town of Aslockton lies on the edge of the fertile Vale of Belvoir in the Midlands of England, surrounded by farmland and patches of forest. According to the current locals at the Cranmer Arms pub, the village boasts a population of around a thousand people, housing one of England's few remaining blacksmiths and farriers. Visitors can take hiking tours by the river along the same footpaths Thomas Cranmer himself walked 500 years ago. You want to get the, when was this published? 2016, so it's one of the newer ones unless it has a date before that. It's published by William Hurd B. Erdmans. And the bio on her, she's an English professor, writer, and three-time fellow of Yale Divinity School. Her other books include Judas Conspiracy, When Anything Goes, Being Christian in a Postmodern World. The picture on the front is Flick. The flick one of 15 depends on when you date it, 45 or 46. There's, I'm not sure how it's dated there, whether it's 45 or 46. I've seen both dates referred to.
in 1500, the land around the ancient town as locked in, in Nottinghamshire looked much as it did when Robin Hood roamed and ruled in nearby Sherwood Forward, Forest three centuries early. Er, in Cranmer's time, Major Oak, Robin Hood's legendary headquarters, still spread its majestic branches and birches with long, gangly silver trunks, provided shade for emerald grass and winding footpaths. The remains of an old Norman mop and wattle castle with a moat had disintegrated into the mound, forming the gardens, the pleasure grounds of the lord of the private manor. Thomas Sr., Thomas Cranmer Sr., his young son Thomas used to sit on top of the mound and gaze toward the gardens and meadows around him, listening to the bells of St. John of Beverly and Watton. There's some embellishing going on. I don't know if there's any documentation for that. But let's go on. We'll have to point out fact from embellishment. Thomas Cranmer was born on 2 July 1489 in Aslacton on an estate with a rich history, land that had been a Roman settlement belonging to King Edward until the Norman Conquest of 1066. As recorded in the Doomsday Book, William the Conqueror himself had given the estate to Walter D. Dancourt after the Battle of Hastings. One of the three original manors in the parish, it came into the hands of De Aslockton family during Henry II's reign. Simon de Aslockton served as the sheriff of Nottinghamshire during 1260 and part of 1261. This is nice. Normally they don't give you some of this, this color, local, region, local, uh, municipal, you want to call it a city, it's a village. In 1460, Cranmer's grandfather, Edmund, married the last surviving heir, Isabella de Aslockton, and the estate with the manor passed into Cranmer hands. Located in the center of the village, the estate covered 500 to 600 acres. That's a lot, including meadows and forest land. The population of the village was around 40 people, with 18 living outside the settlement. The old Aslacton Castle Mound provided a high ground for the gardens and is now called Cranmer's Mound in honor of the young boy who used to sit there. Edmund's marriage to Isabella de Aslacton was a step up for him. She came from a knighted family, and Edmund, arriving from nearby Lincolnshire, aspired to higher social status. Though the Cranmer wealth was modest compared to that of other states surrounding Aslacton, Aslacton, a desire toward upward social mobility passed from Edmund to his son Thomas, the father of Thomas, the Archbishop. And here there, she's reading things into his mens rea that may be more Leslie than uh, the father and grandfather. <clears throat> Thomas Sr. called him himself Esquire in his will and chose to be buried in the larger, grander parish of Watton instead of the smaller chapel of Holy Trinity in Aslack that locked him. Half a mile away, the village of Watton had grown up around one of the three original estates and St. John of Beverly was the main church in the parish. The Cranmer family worshipped in Watton, although the archbishop's father left the small chapel in Aslockton a little something in his will. A footpath leads from the center of modern Aslockton to Watton, beginning a couple of hundred yards from Cranmer's Mound, traveling along a hedgerow over a stile to the river, offering a glimpse of the Watton church standing high over the river banks. Because Thomas Cranmer's family dated back to the Norman Conquest in 1066, 
family members had the right to a family crest and coat of arms. British heraldry was a holdover from medieval times when a coat of arms, a literal coat worn over the arms, armor of knights, was essential for quick recognition in battle. At first, knights would choose their own symbols and colors, but the situation soon devolved into pandemonium and an organized system took over with the king granting all arms. Families selected from two medals, gold and silver, and up to seven colors with symbolic attachments, red for military strength, blue for loyalty, green for hope, black for grief or constancy, orange for worthwhile ambition, maroon for patience in battle, and purple for royalty. By the time Cranmer became archbishop, property was also required as a qualification for a coat of arms or crest. Though the need for instant battlefield identification had passed with the code of chivalry, the ancient custom appealed to those who wanted to be identified with social status. In 1501, Thomas Sr. died, leaving behind his will three sons and four daughters. Oh, I thought it was five daughters. Okay, we'll, we'll just go with it. It was a sizable family. Seven here, eight was my understanding who were faced with the issue of the tomb. And it means that they went in and about that area as they laid their father to rest. Thomas himself, I think he was the second out of the seven or eight, I think. And I'm wondering if Mrs. was buried there too. Nobody talks about Mrs. Cranmer. Grateful to have the privilege of burial among glorious knights and clergy of old, the family didn't know how to compete with the ornate tombs and effigies of the greater estates around them. They selected a simple, unextravagant limestone slab for Thomas and cut it with life-size engraving of him dressed in plain clothes with long hair and a purse. At the same time, they included two crests on the tomb the family shield, a chevron with three cranes, a pun, a pun on the family name, Cranmer, paired with the Newmark shield, thus aligning them themselves with the ancient ancestry. Perhaps the mi mixed message on Thomas Sr.'s tomb represented the family's own mixed feelings about their place in society. They were an old family, yes, but with little wealth or distinction. Five, six hundred acres of land, you can farm that. <laughs> My great grandparents had a hundred acres that they farmed. That's a lot of land. I live on an acre and a hundred of these. Be a lot to plow up. Perhaps the next message on Thomas Sr.'s tomb. Okay, read that. When Thomas became archbishop, he designed his own shield in keeping with tradition. He changed his family's imagery from cranes to pelicans. According to legends, pelicans shed their own blood to feed their young. <coughs> the symbol of Christ reflected the position, position Cranmer embraced with his new office. It also foreshadowed his own death. The time Cranmer's appointment, Henry said in an understatement, you are likely to be tested if you stand to tackling at length. There's no footnotes. We got footnotes through here? Zero. Oh, I'm, they got end notes, so you got to go back to the back. I hate those things. Man, I like to see it when I'm reading it. Alas. Um, well, we're looking at the index. I wonder if they get... It's got a modest bibliography, okay. Oh, I'm just... Where's the index? Do they, they got predestination just for fun? Nope, not a thing. Got real presence. Uh, 
Cranmer also added three sink foils, C-I-N-Q-U-E foils, F-O-I-L-S, sink foils, whatever that is, from his mother's arms and a crescent, symbol of a younger son. The shield was impaled or paired with the shield of the Sea of Canterbury. For his signet, the seal used to sign official papers, Cranmer kept the old family design with no crescent. After Thomas Sr.'s death, the estate could support only one of the children, and so it passed to Thomas's older brother, John. The medieval firstborn winner take all practice of primogeniture, genitor, kept the estates from being parceled away over the centuries, while at the same time providing the church and the army with an influx of talent from the second sons of the nobility, which is what happened to young Thomas. Before he died, Thomas Sr. felt it important to provide an education for both younger sons, Thomas and Edmund, so they could enter the ranks of the clergy. He left them each a small annual allowance. A very young Cranmer probably started at the local village school, then progressed to grammar school, where he was beaten into quiet submission by a cruel schoolmaster, quote, a rude parish clerk in that barber's time, close quote. The history of education is dotted with the image of young boys wrapped on the knuckles, bullied by tyrannical teachers, and Cranmer's story to be, seems to be one case of an early lesson in survival. The story later told by Cranmer's secretary addresses Cranmer's mild and unargumentative personality, suggesting that as a result of the cruel treatment at school, Cranmer grew into a timid man. Cranmer's schoolmaster, so, quote, appalled, dulled, and daunted, close quote, the tender and fine minds of his scholars, that they ended up hating literature, losing both memory and natural audacity in the face of such treatment. While Thomas's father was still alive, he encouraged the young boy to engage in other pursuits besides studies. Raising him to be a proper English gentleman, he took Thomas hunting and hawking and taught him to ride even the roughest horses. This training stood Thomas in good stead when he became archbishop. A good horseman, he could ride with the best, taking time and occasion to enjoy the recreational sports of hunting and hawking. He killed deer with a crossbow, even when his sight was failing. In 1503, at age 14, Cranmer went to Cambridge to study at Jesus College. The family's decision to send him there must have been made in the face of social and family interests. Two of Cranmer's relatives by marriage chose to attend the rival school of Oxford, and two of his other friends, Christopher Tamworth and Robert Clifton, went to different colleges at Cambridge. However, two of Cranmer's young contemporaries from Lincolnshire, Thomas Good Goodrich and John Whitwell, decided to attend Jesus College as well, which may have had a bearing on Cranmer's decision. Remaining lifelong friends, the three of them rose in the clergy ranks, Goodrich becoming a Bishop of Eli and Lord Chancellor, and Whitwell serving as Cranmer's personal chaplain throughout his years as Archbishop. In the 1500s, benefactors competed to establish new colleges in the two centers of English learning, Oxford and Cambridge. In 1494 or 95, Lady Margaret Beaufort, mother of Henry VII, met with John Fisher, later Bishop of Rochester, over a meal. During that meal, she asked him to be her spiritual guide convinced her to become involved in the future of Cambridge, thus a few fruitful collaboration of the two benefactors. In 1496, the last of the nuns departed the Benedictine convent of St. Mary and St. Radigan, east of Cambridge. According to tradition, the nuns had gained 
a reputation for lascivious living. With a small endowment, the bishop established Jesus College on the convent's spacious grounds. The nun's refectory became the college hall. The former prioress's lodging became the master's lodge. And the Bishop of Eli modified and reduced the chapel in scale. In 1503, Thomas arrived at Cambridge. John Fisher had become vice chancellor. And he and Lady Margaret were already set on a course to make Cambridge a leader in all Northern European humanistic learning. I wish we had more footnotes. And I don't like having to go fishing for them at the end. In Cranmer's first years at Jesus College, they financed the refurbishing and upgrading of the college. Lady Margaret made annual visits, and on her last one, she brought along her son, King Henry VII, and her grandson, Prince Henry, to the university commencement with her. Cranmer began his B.A. studies in 1503, moving from the Cranmer holdings and mound, where he used to gaze over the gardens on his family's estate, to Cambridge, living in the refurbished nuns' convent, surrounded by spacious grounds of field and forest. He was entering a new world and a changing one. Cambridge, Chapter 2. Oh, and then they got... Second collect, second uh, the the collect for the second Sunday in Advent. Blessed Lord, which has caused all those holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we would in such wise read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience, comfort of Thy Word we may embrace, and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life which thou hast given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Just glorious, Bishop. Theophilus Herder used that over and over. We learned it from memory, just going to his New Testament classes. He loved that. You know, and I'm coming out of a Presbyterian background and not a prayer book background, and I'm listening to him, and boom, it sticks in my ears. I'm a prayer book man like him. Ran reformed and or trucked in like him. In 1500, higher education in England was beginning a radical transition in thought, curriculum, and method, reflecting a major shift in worldview. A student entering Cambridge in the early 1500s could expect a new course of study, not the old medievalism taught in the past centuries. I'm not convinced of this. However, the transition in studies was gradual, thank you. Scholasticism had ruled the universities since the 12th century as a method in which scholars attempted to reconcile, synthesize, and resolve tensions between faith and reason. Augustine provided the maxim for scholasticism, understand so that you may believe, believe so that you may understand. No footnote, just a quote. Through the Holy Spirit, we and I, I'm, I'm aware of the two statements, um, or the two. They exist, but she needs a footnote, Augustine, if she's going to write a book. Though the Holy Spirit was still the supreme source of the knowledge of God. And Aquinas recognized the Bible as the source of doctrine. Reason illuminated by God was duty bound to investigate and expound Christian authoritative information, which was the Bible. When the sides of faith were argued in a series of dialectics, the two sides of an argument could be made whole or resolved through formal logic. Closely linked with philosophy, scholasticism was a serious attempt to reconcile the major questions of faith and life, and it continued to be the method of study when Cranmer got to Jesus College. The curriculum had been revised in 1488 to reflect the different approach, the new trend of intellectual thought. Humanism, a rising current 
of philosophy and literature was prevalent among ref Renaissance thinkers and helped to fuel the Reformation. Humanism shifted the focus from the next life to this one. Emphasizing human dignity as a central concern, along with the value of the individual, beauty as a deep inner virtue, <laughs> and worldly achievement and pleasures. Please, here. academic study shifted from the interpretation to original sources. I used to kind of follow this line of thinking, but including newly discovered classical texts of the ancient languages of Latin and Greek. Thomas Cranmer entered this maelstrom of thought in 1503, beginning a four-year program at Cambridge, classical literature for the first two years, logic in the third year, and philosophy in the fourth year, matriculating with a BA. A next course of study was the MA, with arithmetic, music, geometry, and astronomy. With no professors of formal or formal classes, the Cambridge teaching system employed masters, men who had, had passed the MA and had been licensed by their university colleagues to tutor. These masters taught the younger students by assigned readings and giving examinations that consisted of oral arguments over questions the students put forth. Students held these disputations with the first senior students, then with the masters. The method of learning continued as scholars rose in academia and gained degrees. The masters studied and disputed with doctors in divinity, canon and civil law and medicine, and eventually themselves becoming doctors in the specific disciplines. Well, this may be a nice place to stop. She's doing a very nice descriptive job um, a few questions that we have as a matter of history, um, a few footnoting issues, but in terms of color and narrative, it's a lovely volume that she has, and I still would recommend it carefully and slowly, but I would certainly have this on my shelf. Well, I do have it on my shelf, but for newbies, um, it's a good book, but I still recommend Pick up, get strips, volumes on archive.org and read John Strip if you want to meet the real Thomas Cranmer. Uh, let's, as we usually do, finish with a hymn here. Uh, this is by Charles Price. Again, a noontime prayer. At prayer time near the temple gate, apostles made a lamb, a lame man walk. They gave him healing in your name. Now give us grace to walk in your way. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.